This is Marin Jose and you're listening to MerlianPodcast.com. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. John Lerma. Dr. John Lerma, author of Learning from the Light, is widely known for his compassionate and loving care of hundreds of terminally ill patients, as well as his tenure as the inpatient medical director for the internationally renowned Medical Center Hospice of Houston, Texas. Dr. Lerma is creating a non-profit company titled Hearts Without Borders, which will take the hospice concept to underserved areas in South America. His organization's current project is to organize a hospice team and travel to several Mexican and South American cities and aid governments and physicians in giving birth to the wonderful gift of hospice. So welcome, Dr. John, to Merlion Podcast. We're very happy to have you with us today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. We can touch on on things that people are, are most interested in. Yes. A lot of people, of course, are very familiar with the term near-death experience. But yes, now, ma'am. reading in your book, you say about pre-death experiences, PDEs. So can you tell us yes. about them from your perspective and what brought sure. them to your awareness in the first place? First of all, the near-death is, is exactly that. It's someone that's near-death. Uh, and we, we that's probably the the stories that have inundated uh, a lot of the market, the media market and, and uh, books, whatnot, from Dr. Raymond Moody. He was uh, the gentleman, uh, MD, that, uh, that coined actually that term, uh, uh, near-death experience. Yeah. And uh, basically what it is, someone who is clinically dead, and, uh, and I've had some of those patients, that we try to revive. Most of them uh, probably are cardiac patients that have had heart attacks, yes. and their heart stops uh, for minutes at a time, and we revive them using the, uh, the paddles, you know, pushing electricity through their, through their body to restart their heart. And it's during those times uh, when they come back uh, that they start, almost immediately, start commenting about what they're seeing from the corner of the room. Mm. And it seems to be always the corner of the room Mm-hmm. And they, uh, they're very specific. They're very specific. They, they can tell uh, how, or they know the numbers of patients in the room or, or rather the medical personnel. Right. Uh, they'll leave, they can even move from the corner closer and uh, just with a thought, they say. Mm-hmm. And they can look at your name tag, get the names, and they, they're aware that they are not in their body because they can mm-hmm. see their body and they're aware that the, their body is dead. Yes. Not that they're dead. Their body is lifeless. Yes. And so they, but they're also aware of a conversation, uh, uh, the binary system, if you will, of, uh, of the earthly life, and then right behind them is the, the, uh, the heavenly realm. Mm. And from, that, from those two realms, and they're right in the middle, they're, they're hearing both of them. Mm. They're hearing us, and they're hearing the other side, and sometimes they're being called to mm. go back, and they're giving explanations as to why. Uh, some of the patients are asking to, no, I don't want to go back. Um, and they're not forced, per se, but then they're given some, uh, what some of these patients have told me, they're giving, um, like, informed consent. They're being right. informed as to why they're going to go back and the importance of it, and they, and they acknowledge it, and they, they're more than happy to do so. So, you know, they're, they're discussing both sides, and, and uh, what they see on the other side is mainly light, Yes. For the most part. However, remember, we, all this energy has created this, this universe, this world, the trees, everything, mm. the pattern. And so we can create whatever we want to bring us into a familiar state that won't make us too fearful. Right. Believe it or not, some people will yeah. be fearful when they're seeing the other side. It, or, or some of these deaths are so sudden yes. that, uh, that they're not ready for it. And uh, so the other side will will present themselves in a very familiar pattern. Uh, their, their mother has passed, the mother will come, usually in a, in a very healthy state, usually in the 30s, 40s, what they say, uh, age-wise. Uh, you know, and it makes them very, very comfortable uh, and, and where they can understand it. Uh, others don't need that. Others are, have lived a life, a very highly spiritually connected life, uh, that know that this is what they're going to see. And when they do see it, they, they understand it. Yeah. Uh, and so the other side is just incredible, but it's also part of our of our brain that's still connected to the near-death soul because the, the body's not 
uh, dead yet, but it, it is so weak that it's allowed, uh, we believe it allows the soul from part of the brain that, that has magnetic properties mm. to release it, okay? And uh, the magnetism from the decreased blood flow is decreased, so it, it tends to release uh, the, that energy, sort of like a, like a magnet that's holding on uh, uh, to positrons and the electrons. You know, they both combine. Mm. But, if one, but if the energy to the positron goes away, the electron's just going to go, just sort of float away. And that's basically what's happening. We're being kept in our body through uh, a mechanism of, ma- of magnetics. Mm-hmm. And it's electromagnetic, if you will. And, uh, and so uh, once, once that bloodstream starts being, coming back and we, we, uh, we constitute the heart back into a normal blood flow, well, what happens? It creates an electromagnetic gravitational property. And, and it draws back the, the spirit or the soul, if you will, who we believe has the frequency only for that body. Right. Okay. Now, what yes. the pre-death is, and mm-hmm. to me, that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm a hospice and palliative physician. I graduated from the University of Texas in Austin in uh, the 80s. I became a uh, pharmacist, uh, and I also studied quantum physics. My goodness. But always, always wanted to uh, move into the medical arena. I always had a very big heart, uh, a lot of compassion for people. Mm-hmm. Did not know that it would end up being, that I would end up being a specialist in uh, end of life care but I knew at that moment that during those years that something like that was uh, was what I was led to and why those years because those were the years of, of AIDS uh, that was the, oh, the advent oh, yes. of AIDS that's when it maxed out when people were just dying left and right yes. no one knew what it was we were wearing these incredible suits almost of armor in, yeah. in uh, medical school to protect us because we didn't know what they what it was mm. um, you know, uh, in fact, they used to call it the HTLV3 virus. Now it's, and they went through several names up until now, it's the HIV. But I saw a lot of these people, I, I was never fearful of it. Uh, I, I really felt the compassion towards the people because they were alone in these rooms, these isolated rooms. No oh, one wanted to go in there. Very isolated. I'd, I'd isolated. go in there yes. and I talked to them, and that's when I started to hear these stories. These, these oh. people were days to weeks from death. And I would hear them, you know, they were very, very um, alert. Uh, they, they, they were alert in their uh, person, place, and time. In other words, they were not confused. There were no evidence of fever. They were not on any high-dose uh, opiates, any kind of medications that may have uh, caused hallucination. And mm-hmm. they're talking about, you know, you're, Dr. Lerma, you're the only one that is here. It, it really is sad that people aren't... Uh, acknowledging uh, the dying process because it's really probably the most spiritual area we'll ever be around while you're on earth. Of course. And, and I go, mm-hmm. well, why is that? And he goes, don't you see them? And I go, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. And, and these are thousands and thousands of, of, of people that I've taken care of. You mm-hmm. know, I took care of about 2,000 AIDS patients that died during that time. Mm-hmm. And the ones that could talk told me basically the same thing. You know, some of them in their limited language, but other ones not. But, but there was a dimension that opened up that allowed the spirits, our loved ones that had passed on, to come in and to guide us to journey in, on a journey back home. Uh, on a journey back, not a home that's, that's it, uh, but a home of continued knowledge with many rooms, as the Bible says. Yes. Um, it, it's never ending, so it's never boring. <laughs> One yes. guy said that. <laughs> he like always that. thought, well, if it's just heaven, and that's it. Yeah, you know, and Earth, and uh, well, I guess we just fly around and do whatever. Yes, right. it might be a little boring, and right. goes, and one of them finally said, "No, it's not that." He goes, uh, "It's it's like love uh, transcends space and time. Once you reach one part of the love, which is what they're seeing, he goes, don't you sense that love?" Mm. They all say that. He goes, "Well, it continues. Once you get that love, then you move to the next level. Then you see the love ahead of it, and then the love ahead of that, and the ahead of that, and it never ends." But this is this area. What they're saying here on Earth is is where it starts. It starts, and we have we use involuntary processes within our body, you know, our ego, to continue to uh, the prime directive, and that is to survive, mm-hmm. to survive for lessons, and to to survive to understand what love really is, unconditional love, and and remember, 
I'm, I'm telling you, this is, <laughs> of course, this is all anecdotal, but I think after 30-some thousand people yes. that are saying the same thing, right. I, it's we're very repetitive, and as a scientist, uh, we've got to say that there's something to it. Yes. Um, and I'm talking from all walks of life. And so they're, they're just saying, you know, it, it don't have to get it right. You just have to understand it, and no one's going to get it right no. on the planet. You just got to get the seed planted in your memory banks, mm. because it's those memory banks. It is that quantum brain that continues to the side. So the near-death people, I would ask them, do you see your hands? I mean, do you have a body? And go, no. He goes, well, what about your mind? Are you still thinking the same thing, the same worries? Well, you know, part of it, yes. Mm. But I, I do miss my family, you know, and I, I do look, when I do see the other side, I do look forward to moving in that direction. And it's very familiar, obviously. You know, all of them say that. It's very familiar. I've been there before. Yes. You know, I know it, its existence now. So what they're saying is, is just plant the seed. Just, just, it doesn't cost anything to, and they're saying, Dr. Lamar, tell this to the people, just to open up your heart, to be forgiving to yourself first and loving to yourself, because we cannot change this world unless we change ourselves. Yes, exactly. And, and that is the key. I've heard that, oh, my God, over and over. And that's what the book's uh, main message is, is self-love and self-forgiveness, yes. because nothing can, can happen without that. Exactly. And and so, you know, Western culture is so far from that. But we're moving in that direction. And okay. it's not that it's, they're telling me, John, don't judge it. It's just we're only 6,000 years old as a civilization. And that's what all these people, they're, they're telling me as they're dying. I'm going, God, man, I'm, I'm learning a lot <laughs> you know, about stuff. And then I go and I, and I read about the Egyptians and the Sumerians and how they were very interested in death. And, mm. and they wrote these things down mm. and um, moved to the Greeks and now to where we're at now and uh, in Western society and Eastern society. But the, the Eastern philosophy is a lot much more in tune with death and dying than we are. Oh, Father, um, I know. But that, but that makes sense. I mean, we're, we're only 200 plus years old. Uh, we're moving there. Yeah, uh, we're going we're through the birth that. pain. There was one lady, as she was dying, she said, you know, I see now. You, you, when you see the other side and they're around you, you're gifted with knowledge. Of understanding of the world mm-hmm. and uh, and amongst other things and so she understood she said it's gonna hurt this change for a lot of us the change does that mm-hmm. and but but the change is going to come whether we want to or not it it is part of that mechanism that evolutionary uh, drive to keep our the destiny of what where we're heading yes. moving yes. Um, and so so the pre death is that is these people who are terminally ill right and who are days from dying, who are, can still talk, that see almost exactly the same thing the near-death patients are seeing, but they're telling you in their body. Yes. And so because of that, we're able to do, uh, we do uh, several scientific uh, researches on them, experiments. We're able to do these MRIs, these functional MRIs, these MEG scans that can show us what part of the brain is being used uh, during these visions. Mm-hmm. And because most doctors today still say, oh, no, they're not visions. They're, halluc- they're just a different type of hallucinations. Hallucinations, yes. Yeah, it's a confused state. It makes mm-hmm. no sense. Mm. Um, uh, pe- it, and it's, it has a cause. It has a physical cause, uh, be it drug, uh, you know, lack of blood flow to the brain from a heart attack or a decreased oxygenation from lungs that are full of lung cancer or people who smoke or... Uh, you know, infections, urine infections can do that. Uh, and we've seen that. A lot of us have seen some of our family members uh, that have had high fevers and they get a little delirious. Well, delirious, delirium and hallucination basically the same, same thing. And after, when, after it's all done and they wake up, they don't recall the, the, uh, the experience. And it doesn't have an effect that's profound in them. Now, the visions are very clearly different. They, there's no fever. They're not on, usually on any drugs. Uh, all their lab work is perfect, even though they're terminally ill. Um, but it always happens at the same time, within four weeks of their death. Really? And Yes, mm. and it increases in time. Mm. And uh, so usually, like, say, the pre-death experiences, and this is what, when I started seeing a lot of these AIDS patients and then getting into hospice, uh, that's all I did. So I would see 
about 200 deaths a month, plus not just those 200 deaths, but I would interview many more people that didn't pass away during that time. And they would, uh, you know, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Oh, that's atheists, what I wanted to agnostic. ask you about. <laughs> yes, because, you know, where does religion play a role in this? When I started seeing all of this, and I was raised Buddhist and Catholic, I'm a Buddha calf. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and actually, actually now I'm a new age Buddha cat, but any <laughs> almost I'm open minded Buddha cat. <laughs> but what all what I started to and I asked my priest, I said, "Look, I'm seeing a murderer. I'm seeing an atheist. Mm-hmm. I'm seeing these people who you condemn that are homosexuals that are dying mm-hmm. and uh, that are sinful, and you say you're going to go to hell. They're all seeing a very positive, loving environment." All of them. I hope so, because that would make sense to me that well, they would. Well, and I told them, that's, what, that's who I know is God. Yes, exactly. And I, why don't you talk about that mm-hmm. at church more often? Why do we... Uh, we are veering away from it slowly, but the fire and brimstone talk, well, that was, that's old stuff to just draw people in. But we know the churches are... A lot of the priests, like I talked to several Catholic priests about this kind of stuff. You know, I talk really? about the Koran, I talk about everything. Yes. You know, I'm not being censored. And oh, so right. these, these priests are, are opening their, their hearts. And it's not just them. And, like, uh, there's a very, very popular uh, gentleman by the name of uh, Joel Olstein that's out of Houston, where I live oh, as well. Oh, yes, yes, I like him. He's the new type of many, many of my patients who died there in Houston said, look at Joel Olstein. He's the perfect, that's Mm-hmm. Where we're moving. Mm-hmm. That's where we're moving. A man that is non judgmental, right. that will take something either out of the Quran, out of the Bible, whatever. He is Christian, though. Yeah. And but one sentence, and then use that uh, to explain what you're, what's happening in your life, mm-hmm. your, the economy. Why, why, what do I have to do? And, and also that you're not going to be perfect. You're not going to get it right. And, and that, you know, for the Christians, you know, it's, that's what. Christ died for, you know, he, he, he emphasizes that, but the point is, is that there's people in there, there's Jews in there, there's Muslim friends of mine, we all go there because he's so, so not judgmental, he's so non-condemning, and that is why he's doing so well, yes. and that's the new, that, that's what the, this new church that's coming, and, uh, and he's moving rapidly, you know, his father was a, ba- I believe he was a Baptist, and, and started to develop that in inner uh, knowledge of uh, of quantum entanglement of that we're all connected mm-hmm. that uh, no matter what religion that uh, we needed to shift away from the fear that religion was posing the the image that uh, religion was making of God and uh, he said man has created God in their in our image instead mm-hmm. of the other way and and that's the ego, you know, doing that. So he wanted to move away from that, and thus he created the Joel Osteen, or the those that ministry. Oh, and uh, of course, they they uh, fired him when he he wanted to do that, and and that was the best thing. They fired and, him. Yeah, they fired oh, him from the. Okay. You know, they ousted him from that Baptist. Of course, right. because it's not. I live in the Bible Belt. They're very strict here. Yes. yes. <laughs> I I even was uh, castigated for uh, writing this book really? from the from the hospitals and from the doctors and the, yeah. the local churches. Yes. Part of it is, you know, I'm telling the stories of the patients. Some of them are very Christian-based, and people ask me, well, is that the way it is? Well, these are their stories. But then there's other ones. But the basic thing people aren't getting is that read through all of that. It, it's everyone seeing the same thing. Everyone's feeling the same thing. Mm. This incredible love, the non-condemnation, the non-judgment, that there is no hell, and in fact... What these people, especially these AIDS patients, and now it's women, you know, and babies are dying from AIDS, and yeah. and so it's everyone. It's not just homosexuals. Mm-hmm. And um, what they're saying is, is John, Dr. Lerner, oh my God, you have nothing to worry about because they are there to not, uh, yeah, to review your life, mm-hmm. but they're not there to review your life or God in a very judgmental way. They are there to protect you from your judgment or your self-conviction. Right. Because we are our worst enemy. That makes we sense. Are. Yes, I know that. We, and so what, what is God going to do? You know, God never shows himself, or rarely to anybody. You know, I mean, he, he doesn't sit next to you at the end of the day and say, hey, okay, son, here's, here's the plan. Mm. Well, how can, you know, when you don't see something, you don't believe anything, 
or you don't see something and uh, you don't have a relationship with, with something the way we have relationships with our children and our family and then expect at the end of life that that person is going to judge us and send us to hell well, of course that's such farce yeah you know that's yeah. that's that's dinosaur stuff that's right good 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 <laughs> Girl. And I just tell people, please, I, I mean, as a Catholic, I can understand the guilt. <laughs> I'm, I'm there, you know, but we are moving away from that. Yes. Uh, Obama's doing, playing a big role in that. You know, Joel Osteen's playing a big role. You're yes. playing a big role through your radio station, you know, yes. uh, and that's why, uh, you know, Dr. Turner and a lot of these, uh, yes. Peter Fenwick. Yes. And if you haven't had Peter, uh, Peter, Dr. Peter Fenwick on your show, he's so incredible. He's from England. Oh, yes, I've and heard a lot about him. A neuropsych- yeah. neuropsychiatrist who mm-hmm. has written a book of, about also in hospice but also near death but he's more of a researcher and he's doing uh, these documentaries with us as well oh that's what i and, wanted to ask you about the research that is being done now on this because that yeah, must be fascinating so here's the thing so the near death they're out of their body how do you how do you research that yeah you know well you research it first of all scientists will only research things that are repetitive in large, large numbers. And we know now that uh, near death is a very repetitive pattern, um, especially to bring patients back. Mm-hmm. And so they, I think Cornell University and uh, someone out of England are doing this uh, large, large study um, on, on near death. I know a Dr. Von Timmel, oh, yes. Von Timmel a German mm-hmm. cardiologist, mm-hmm. Uh, he's in major research, he's written great books. But Europe much more advanced, but uh, Dr. Bruce Grayson out yes. of the University of Virginia, right. incredible mm-hmm. physician, uh, it, and, and so they're coming up with these theories, okay, so if they're out of their body, how can we prove that? What can we do, you know? Well, mm-hmm. it's harder with a near death. You can only postulate things, mm-hmm. um, but with a pre-death, it's a lot easier because they're still living, or, or I mean, they're still talking, yeah. uh, and so you can bring them in, one of the research is blood, okay? Is there any new chemical? Oh, that's, that's being, interesting, the blood. That's being, the blood. yeah, is there any new chemical that's being released? Okay. And so they they found one, it's called DMT, dimethyltryptamine, mm-hmm. and there's a Dr. Strassman um, who has a very uh, popular book, actually for a long, for quite a time now, uh, it's called, I think the DMT molecule or the God molecule. Oh, yes. Um, right. He's a wonderful man. I think he's a neuro, neuroradiologist, something like that. But he, uh, like like myself and like these other doctors, we just sort of came into this. It just We started seeing repetitive patterns. And he, being more of a pathology kind of guy, you know, neuro, he looked at blood work and, and doing uh, autopsies. They, they saw that there was a high chemical called DMT in these people mm-hmm. that passed away, especially high-stress situations, and they did more research on it, and they found out that uh, um, it's like LSD uh, in that it's a hallucinogen. Right. Okay, so, so immediately a lot of the doctors, but this is not the way it turned out, immediately all the doctors, they go, oh, well, there's your answer. It's a hallucinogen. It's, yes. it's a protective mechanism for the brain, and it ha- lets you see things so that you're right. you can die comfortably. And I go, okay, fine, fine. So let's let's get some and let's do some experiments. So that's what they've done, mm. you know, Fenwick and those guys and uh, Strassman, and they've given this uh, DMT to many people, and it does not have. I could have told them that the same effect. I could have told them that there's not one thing. It's, it's, it's about connection. It's about interconnectedness. It's about a balance of things. It's the mind-body-spirit. It's about something tangible to, to the intangible, as much as the intangible. And, uh, and so, but what they found with the DMT, if you take it and you're not dying, that you're going to have hallucinations. You are going to have hallucinations. Right. You're going to see aliens, and <laughs> a lot of people see aliens. And they do see people, but they're not like, they're not like their deceased loved ones. Okay. okay yeah. And they're not giving them messages from the other side, so forth. Uh, so, but we do know. So we know that alone, it, it, it's not responsible for that, and alone, it does cause a lot of anxiety. So, uh, but these people who are passing away, the ones that I'm interviewing, a day, two, three days before, are smiling, are elated, are in ecstasy. Uh, it, I mean, they use these words, exhilarated. They're they're dying with 
a smile yes. on their face. Yeah. I mean, that, and it is a real smile. And and uh, and so that's the chemical that's really, really high, but we know that it's all coming from the pineal gland. All right. Uh, the gland, which is at the center of the brain, which we, science really never paid attention to it. <laughs> they didn't think it did anything or, you know, it had no use. They always but say know, that. <laughs> yeah, and mm. uh, but, you know, the Egyptians knew it. The, yes. the Egyptians would talk about the third eye. And that's what it's called. That's another name for the third eye. Uh, we know that it it's also uh, has some responsibility for sixth sense. So when people, these people are passing away, what we're doing other than just drawing blood, we're doing MRIs, these new type of MRIs that look at the brain in real time. Mm -hmm. And one is called the functional MRI. The other one's called a magnetic electroencephalogram, which is the latest, latest, latest one. And there's only two in the United States and maybe one or two in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them in the United States, which ought, which is very interesting, was given anonymously, was paid for, and given to one of the top hospitals. Anonymously. Like, we don't know who it oh. is or what, but was left with a note that this would be one of the, the, uh, the latest uh, technical machines that would prove or help prove an afterlife. Mm -hmm. And whoever it was, uh, doctors didn't know that. I mean, they weren't. They didn't know that. That's what they. They were making that MRI just to look at the brain in real time. Actually, it's right at the moment that you're thinking, they can see where it lights up. So if you move your pinky, and you're in, you're under that MEG scan, which is which sort of looks like a 1950s hair dryer, right. and you're sitting right right under it. Yeah. Uh, it's picking up that area. If you're angry, it'll pick up that area right. where you're angry, and uh, so it shows a lot of patterns. So. What happened, they were doing a, a MEG scan on a lady who, uh, in a functional MRI, who they didn't think was going to die, but they, she had seizures, and they wanted to pinpoint them. Mm -hmm. And uh, by pinpointing them, they can do surgery and, and uh, you know, uh, burn it, and that way they won't have any more uh, uh, seizures. And so that's where they're coming from. But they found a tumor in this lady, and the lady passed away within three weeks after that. So she falls within the four weeks of uh, mm. the visionary period. Mm. And during that time, she had been telling these doctors that she was seeing her deceased loved ones. And they and deceased loved ones and spirits and that she was going to pass and she was so excited and she needed to get closure and give closure to her family. And uh, But the doctors all attributed it to hallucinations from the seizures. And uh, But now, with the research and then looking at that, I go, no, you know, knowing that she did die the next three weeks, three weeks later, we knew she fell under what we call the visionary period uh, prior to death. And so what they found, other than the tumor, was that the temporal lobes were very, very brightly lit, which they didn't understand, but they just sort of blew off. Uh, a lot of the brain was really brightly lit, uh, which was uh, unheard of. Uh, it, it usually lights up in segments, may, maybe in milliseconds. It's like a thunderstorm with lightning just hitting areas. And But to light up at the same time, that's something different. They, they didn't know how to explain that. And uh, so, you know, we extrapolated that and said, hey, maybe we can do the MEG scan. Well, I don't have access to that, but we have the access to the PET scan and the MEG and the functional MRI, and both of those, pick up more the blood flow to the brain, and it does pick up where the brain is working, but it lags by two seconds. The MEG scan, the nearest one, it works mainly through magnetic properties, through the quantum uh, field, and uh, through nanoparticles that's being released by the brain cells. So it doesn't really totally rely on blood flow. So, um, you know, the down turn on this thing uh, with the functional MRI and the PET scan is that if people are very close to dying, their heart uh, is pumping very little blood. So with little blood pump being pumped, we're gonna, you know, the theory is, well, we're not going to get the same kind of result on the brain being lit. Uh, well, you know what? We did it anyhow. I did anyhow. And uh, what I found out was incredible. Uh, the lady had a what we call an ejection fraction of about 15%, which 15% of her heart was pumping blood. You need about a good 20 plus percent, maybe maybe more, 
anything 20% or less is hospice, you're terminally ill. Um, but it's not 100, it never gets to 100. Normal is 50 to 70. And so you need to, somewhere 30s or so forth to get enough blood flow, enough pressure behind it, the, you know, uh, to get it to the brain and to get the brain uh, to work properly. Well, these people with an ejection fraction of 15% were speaking so profound, so alert, and I'm going, wait, this is not possible. Oh. They, they barely have any pulses you can oh. pick up. Their, their skin's so pale, they're congested, they have no urine output. They're, they're just about dead. Yes. And, but they're talking like, like they're probably the most intelligent person in the world. And uh, like these idiot savants. And I'm going, wow, this is really weird. Let's get them down and do an MRI. Mm-hmm. Get them down and do the MRI and the PET scan, and it showed that the temporal lobes and a lot of the brain was lit up. Well, how was it lit up without any blood flow yes. or significant blood flow? And so that's where, that's where as scientists, that's where we're at. We're, we we believe that because of the MEG scan is picking up quantum particles, you know, magnetic. Yes. It's a mag, it's a magnetic effect, but the physical body creates the tangible uh, ability or the ability to create that magnetic impulse. But if you don't have that blood flow, we believe, like everything else, there's a binary system. There's a backup system. And the backup system is, is the quantum field. It's what's outside of us. Right. That, the, that the pineal gland, the brain, has the ability to pick up gravi- gravitational energy, electromagnetic energy, from, from around it, the universal, whatever you want to call it, you know, the Akashic field. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's what we think it is. And, and uh, they've done a few experiments where they've checked uh, around the scalp, uh, and around the room and around the area of the patient to see if they can pick up a higher reading, electromagnetic reading, and, and they've been able to do that. So there's something going on with electromagnetism outside. So science, per se, has always said the brain cannot do that. No, the right. brain mm. cannot, does not have the ability to have telepathy, has the ability to think or to know what someone else is thinking. It's within the skull, and it only stays within the skull. Well, I tell you what, we've disproved that. Yes. And, 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 and that's been disproven a long time ago. I mean, that's come on. Yeah. You and your mom, I'm sure, have called each other at times, uh, okay. maybe at the same time, where when you're thinking of someone you hadn't heard from in a long time, you get a call the next day. We had it all the time. Within, okay, yeah. what is that? That is the yeah. quantum entanglement. Yeah. We know now physicists have proved that. Mm. So what's happening right now you know, is that physics, physicists, biologists, doctors, and, and uh, many of the scientists are not talking to each other, but they're coming up to, to a level of where, um, to a line where they have to accept that there, there's a connection of, of yeah. everything and everyone, mm-hmm. that, the, that there is something beyond the tangible. And so the biologists uh, know that, that there's more than just the, the chemical, okay? Mm-hmm. So, and, so the, the physicists know already know there was more than the chemical inside the body they knew it was entangled from the quantum particles you know mm-hmm. and that was because Einstein uh, was trying to prove the unified field theory so really all in all we have to thank the physicists for all of, for us bridging the gap between religion and science that's right and we're going to start hearing more and more of this on TV right now because of the where the economy's at and the world's at uh, they're not paying attention to it, but it, it's coming out. That's right. It's coming out, and it's and it's here. And everybody, <laughs> I got to tell you, we continue to exist. I've seen it. We've we've taken. Yeah. I believe it in in my heart. Uh, we we've taken digital pictures of people because uh, it you know the digital camera will pick up uh, a lot of segments uh, in the atmosphere including uh, some of it's an infrared, we'll do that as well. Mm. And we will pick up, we do pick up uh, uh, sheets of, of light energy come uh, around the body as, as the patient has passed. Oh, really? And so we, we know, know, we know yeah. there's energy that's yes. being released. And, of course, Einstein said energy is neither created nor destroyed to change its form. So you can change that consciousness. It's neither created nor destroyed. It just changes its place where it's at. 
And so consciousness is the beginning of everything. It, it is, you know, like in the beginning, That's right. there was the Word of God, and the Word is created by thought. And it is thought. And that's why Amit Goswami, the physicist, is saying consciousness is the ground of all being. And what's exciting is that you're now going to put together a film, or you're, or you're all coming together, a group of you, to do a film. Is that correct? Yes. Well, in fact, uh, uh, it's the way, I think, the way the divine order of things works. Uh, it, everybody's just coming together. Uh, we've been uh, called by uh, this, uh, one, three people, one of them from Universal Studios is looking at uh, Paul Davids. Um, his wife is the vice president of Universal Studios. They're uh, looking into making, actually they already filmed me in part of it, uh, The Afterlife explaining it. Okay. Uh, what, yeah. what drew them into this? Well, they've had experiences, personal experiences uh, with this. And, and also there's a uh, 20th, 20th Century Fox has a division now that uh, it's called the Faith Division or really? the Spiritual Division division and uh, this is really really new and they knew that uh, this is what people are wanting to hear now uh, uh, you know they're they're wanting to know of course they're coming in from the money but who cares you know there's necessary evils yeah exactly <laughs> who cares and they're getting in on the bandwagon that's fine yeah yeah you know as long as it comes out that's fine it changes people's lives whether you want to or not and the big big message from my patients is tell people not to fear there is yes. we, it's so much better, but it was, yes. you will understand, and, and slowly you'll get more and more messages from other patients. And I'm, I'm not going to write a third book. The first one was Into the Light, the third, second one's Learning from the Light. You know, the publishing company came up with those names. That's not what I came up with. Right. <laughs> this oh, whole okay. light thing, but it really, the first book was really entitled Negotiating with Angels. Oh. And because that's the word my patients used. They were negotiating. Really? They were negotiating whether to come back or forward, and that's, it's free will. Oh, I love so that. So obviously you can negotiate. It's free yeah. will, and the free will continues. But see, our free will is so misunderstood, and, and we're, it's, it's growing. It's growing and it's growing, but there's mm-hmm. involuntary backup systems that could hopefully sometimes prevent us from doing horrible things, but obviously not, not strong enough. Mm-hmm. But in the end, it's up to us, and it's up to us to make the change. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we, we are... The kingdom is within us. Yes. You know, God's not just sitting on a throne somewhere dictating. No. He's in us. He's That's in the right. trees. He's in everything. And he feels if we're mean to ourselves, we're hurting him too. And But he will give us the tools necessary. And the second biggest message is they always tell him, tell everybody to follow their passion. Even right. if they're ridiculed, follow yes. that passion yes. because all the tools have been given to you. Right. If you think you have no money, trust me, it'll come if the yes. passion is in there. If, you, if it's something that doesn't make a whole lot of money, then fine. Work somewhere else, but follow your passion. Yes. Because that's where your true joy and that's where the change of the world will come. Oh, thank you yeah. so much, sure. Dr. John. <laughs> now, we really, really would like you to come back. Uh, oh, and, and, and uh, any time. I, I, I'd oh. love to. And no. I love it. <laughs> I, I love it and I love what you're doing. And, and <laughs> it you. really is an exciting to all the listeners. Uh, oh, is, listening to your show, it's, mm-hmm. you're doing a great job. We can talk. I'd love to talk more about some of the stories and, and more of the yes. messages my patients have. But. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to hear them and our listeners and our readers. That that's really now a promise. So now, sure. can <laughs> can you give and, us your uh, website? It's very important sure, that people go sure. to your if, website. If anybody has any mess, uh, you know, any questions, or if mm. you have a loved one that may be passing, me right. just ask something or just anything. Uh, I'd be happy. I answer all my emails. Oh, Maybe wonderful. Maybe a little slow. So it's drjohnlerma.com, and it's Dr., uh, just a short, uh, it's D-R, and then J-O-H-N-L-E-R-M, as in mother, A, dot com. And okay. just go to the contact section, and you can give me a con- you know, just wonderful. an email there. And it's got stories in there about my books. Uh, I keep up with the documentaries where we're at with that. Oh, fantastic. So. That's really helpful. So okay. now, for our listeners, uh, to read a review of your book, Learning from the Light, please visit www.merlionnews.com. And this is Marin Jose, and thank you for listening to merlionpodcast.com, and thank you again. And one is called the functional MRI, the other one's called the magnetic electroencephalogram, which is the latest, latest, latest one. And there's only two in the United States, and maybe one or two in the rest of the world. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them in the United States, which ought, which is very interesting, was given anonymously, was paid for, and given to one of the top hospitals. Anonymously. By, we don't know who it oh. is or what, but was left with a note that this would be one of the the uh, the latest uh, technical machines that would prove or help prove an afterlife. Mm-hmm. And whoever it was, uh, doctors didn't know that. I mean, they weren't. They didn't know that. That's what they. They were making that MRI just to look at the brain in real time. Actually, it's right at the moment that you're thinking, they can see where it lights up. So if you move your pinky. And you're, in, you're under that meg scan, which is which sort of looks like a 1950s hair dryer, right. and you're sitting right right under it. Yeah. Uh, it's picking up that area. If you're angry, it'll pick up that area right. where you're angry. And uh, so it shows a lot of pattern. So what happened, they were doing a, a meg scan on a lady who, uh, in a functional MRI, who they didn't think was going to die, but they, she had seizures, and they wanted to pinpoint them. Mm-hmm. And uh, by pinpointing them, they can do surgery and, and uh, you know, uh, burn it, and that way they won't have any more uh, uh, seizures. And so that's where they're coming from. But they found a tumor in this lady, and the lady passed away within three weeks after that. So she falls within the four weeks of uh, mm-hmm. the visionary period. Mm-hmm. And during that time, she had been telling these doctors that she was seeing her deceased loved ones. And they and deceased loved ones and spirits and that she was going to pass and she was so excited and she needed to get closure and give closure to her family and uh, but the doctors all attributed it to hallucinations from the seizures and uh, but now with the research and then looking at that I go no you know knowing that she did die the next three weeks three weeks later we knew she fell under what we call the visionary period. Uh, prior to death, and so what they found, other than the tumor, was that the temporal lobes were very, very brightly lit, which they didn't understand, but they just sort of blew off. Uh, a lot of the brain was really brightly lit, uh, which was uh, unheard of. Uh, it, it usually lights up in segments, may, maybe in milliseconds. It's like a thunderstorm with lightning just hitting areas. and But to light up at the same time, that's something different. They didn't know how to explain that. And uh, so, you know, we extrapolated that and said, hey, maybe we can do the make time and we revive them using the, uh, the paddles, you know, pushing electricity through their, through their body to restart their heart. And it's during those times uh, when they come back uh, that they start, almost immediately start commenting about what they're seeing from the corner of the room. Mm. And it seems to be always the corner of the room Mm-hmm. And they, uh, they're very specific. They're very specific. They, they can tell uh, how, or they know the numbers of patients in the room or, or rather the medical personnel. Right. Uh, they'll leave, they can even move from the corner closer and uh, just with a thought, they say. Mm-hmm. And they can look at your name tag, get the names, and they, they're aware that they are not in their body because they can mm-hmm. see their body and they're aware that the, the body is dead. Yes. Not that they're dead. Their body is lifeless. Yes. And so they, but they're also aware of a conversation, uh, uh, the binary system, if you will, of, uh, of the earthly life, and then right behind them is the, the, uh, the heavenly realm. Mm. And from, that, from those two realms, and they're right in the middle, they're, they're hearing both of them. Mm. They're hearing us, and they're hearing the other side, and sometimes they're being called to mm. go back, and they're giving explanations as to why. Uh, some of the patients are asking to, no, I don't want to go back. Um, and they're not forced, per se, but then they're given some, uh, what some of these patients have told me, they're giving, um, like, informed consent. They're being right. informed as to why they're going to go back and the importance of it, and they, and they acknowledge it, and they, they're more than happy to do so. So, you know, they're, they're discussing both sides, and, and uh, what they see on the other side is mainly light, Yes. For the most part. However, remember, we, all this energy has created this, this universe, this world, the trees, everything, mm. the patterns. And so we can create whatever we want to bring us into a familiar state that won't make us too fearful. Right. Believe it or not, some people will yeah. be fearful when they're seeing the other side. It, or, or some of these deaths are so sudden 
yeah. that uh, that they're not ready for it. And uh, so the other side will will present themselves in a very familiar pattern. Uh, their their mother has passed. The mother will come, usually in a in a very healthy state, usually in the 30s, 40s, what they say, uh, age wise. Uh, you know, and it makes them very very comfortable. Uh, and course. and where they can understand it, uh, others don't need that. Others are have lived a life, a very highly spiritually connected life, uh, that know that this is what they're going to see, and when they do see it, they they understand it. Yeah. Uh, and so, the other side is just incredible, but it's also part of our of our brain that's still connected to the near death soul, because the the body's not as dead yet, but it is. And it doesn't have an effect that's profound in them. Now, the visions are very clearly different. They, there's no fever. They're not on, usually on any drugs. Uh, all their lab work is perfect, even though they're terminally ill. Um, but it always happens at the same time, within four weeks of their death. Really? And Yes. Mm. And it increases in time. Mm. And uh, so usually, like, say, the pre-death experiences, and this is what when I started seeing a lot of these AIDS patients and then getting into hospice, uh, that's all I did. So I would see about 200 deaths a month, plus not just those 200 deaths, but I would interview many more people that didn't pass away during that time. And they would, uh, you know, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Oh, that's atheists, what I wanted to ask you about. <laughs> yes, because, you know, where does religion play a role in this? When I started seeing all of this, and I was raised Buddhist and Catholic, I'm a Buddha cast. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and actually, actually <laughs> now I'm a new age Buddha cat, but any <laughs> I'm an open minded Buddha cat. <laughs> but what all what I started to and I asked my priest, I said, "Look, I'm seeing a murderer. I'm seeing an atheist. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing these people who you condemn that are homosexuals that are dying mm -hmm. and uh, that are sinful, and you say you're going to go to hell. They're all seeing a very positive, loving environment." All of them. I hope so, because that would make I, well, sense well, to me that well, they would. Well, and I told them, that's, what, that's who I know is God. Yes, exactly. I, why don't you talk about that mm -hmm. at church more often? Why do we... Uh, we are veering away from it slowly, but the fire and brimstone talk, well, that was... That's old stuff to just draw people in. But we know the churches are... A lot of the priests, like I talked to several Catholic priests about this kind of stuff. You know, I talk really? about the Koran, I talk about everything. Yes. You know, I'm not being censored. And oh, so right. these, these priests are, are opening their, their hearts. And it's not just them. And, like, uh, there's a very, very popular uh, gentleman by the name of uh, Joel Olstein that's out of Houston, where I live oh, as well. Oh, yes, yes, I like him. He's the new type of many, many of my patients who died there in Houston said, look at Joel Olstein. He's the perfect, that's Mm -hmm. Where we're moving. Mm -hmm. That's where we're moving. A man that is non judgmental, right. that will take something either out of the Quran, out of the Bible, whatever. He is mm -hmm. Christian, though. Yeah. And but one sentence, and then use that uh, to explain what you're, what's happening in your life, mm -hmm. your, the economy. Why, why, what do I have to do? And, and also that you're not going to be perfect. You're not going to get it right. And, and that, you know, for the Christians, you know, it's, that's what. Christ died for, you know, he, he, he emphasizes that, but the point is, is that there's people in there, there's Jews in there, there's Muslim friends of mine, we all go there because he's so, so not ju judgmental, milliseconds, it's like a thunderstorm with lightning just hitting areas, and, but to light up at the same time, that's something different, they, they didn't know how to explain that, and uh, so, you know, we extrapolated that and said, hey, maybe we can do the mix scan, well, I don't have access to that, but we have the access to the PET scan and the make and the functional MRI, and both of those pick up more the blood flow to the brain, and it does pick up where the brain is working, but it lags by two seconds. The MEG scan, the nearest one, it works mainly through magnetic properties, through the quantum uh, field and uh, through nanoparticles that's being released by the brain cells. So it doesn't really totally rely on blood flow. So, um, you know, the downturn on this thing uh, with the functional MRI and the PET scan is that if people are very close to dying, their heart uh, is pumping very little blood. So with little blood pump being pumped, we're gonna, you know, the theory is, well, we're not going to get the same kind of result on the brain being lit. Uh, 
well, you know what? We did it anyhow. I did it anyhow. And uh, what I found out was incredible. Um, the lady had a what we call an ejection fraction of about 15%, which 15% of her heart was pumping blood. You need about a good 20 plus percent, maybe maybe more. Anything 20 percent or less is hospice. You're terminally ill. Um, but it's not 100. It never gets to 100. Normal is 50 to 70. And so you need to, somewhere 30s or so forth to get enough blood flow, enough pressure behind it, the, you know, uh, to get it to the brain and to get the brain uh, to work properly. Well, these people with an ejection fraction of 15% were speaking so profound, so alert, and I'm going, wait, this is not possible. Oh. They, they barely have any pulses you can oh. pick up. Their their skin's so pale. They're congested. They have no urine output. They're they're just about dead. Yes. And but they're talking like like they're probably the most intelligent person in the world. And uh, like these idiot savants. And I'm going, wow, this is really weird. Let's get them down and do an MRI. Mm -hmm. Get them down to do the MRI and the PET scan, and it showed that the temporal lobes and a lot of the brain was lit up. Well, how was it lit up? without any blood flow yes. or significant blood flow. And so that's where, that's where as scientists, that's where we're at. We're, we, we believe that because of the MEG scan is picking up quantum particles, you know, magnetic. Yes. It's, a mag, it's a magnetic effect, but the physical body creates the tangible uh, ability or the ability angle from the quantum particles. You know, mm -hmm. and that was because Einstein uh, was trying to prove the unified field theory. So really, all in all, we have to thank the physicists for all of, for us bridging the gap between religion and science. That's right. And we're going to start hearing more and more of this on TV right now because of the, where the economy's at and the world's at. Uh, they're not paying attention to it, but it, it's coming out. That's right. It's coming out, and it's and it's here. And everybody, <laughs> I got to tell you, we continue to exist. I've seen it. We've We've taken, yeah. I believe it in, in my heart, uh, we, we've taken digital pictures of people because, uh, it, you know, the digital camera will pick up uh, a lot of segments uh, in the atmosphere, including uh, some of it in infrared, we'll do that as well. Mm. And we will pick up, we do pick up uh, uh, sheets of, of light energy come uh, around the body as, as the patient has passed. Oh, really? And so we know yes, we know there's energy that's yes. being released, and of course Einstein said energy is neither created nor destroyed; it changes form. So you can change that consciousness is neither created nor destroyed; it just changes its place where it's at. And so consciousness is the beginning of everything. It, it is, you know, like in the beginning, that's right. There was the word of God, and the word is created by thought. And it is thought. And that's why Amit Goswami, the physicist, is saying consciousness is the ground of all being. And what's exciting is that you're now going to put together a film, or you're, or you're all coming together, a group of you, to do a film. Is that correct? Yes. Well, in fact, uh, uh, it's the way, I think, the way the divine order of things works. Uh, it, everybody's just coming together. Uh, we've been uh, called by uh, this uh, one. Three people, one of them from Universal Studios is looking, uh, Paul Davids, um, his wife is the vice president of Universal Studios, they're uh, looking into making, actually they already filmed me in part of it, uh, The Afterlife explaining it. Oh, uh, what, yeah. what drew them into this? Well, they've had experiences, personal experiences uh, with this, and, and also there's a uh, 20, 20th Century Fox has a division now that uh, it's called the faith division or really? the spiritual division and uh, this is really really new and they knew that uh, this is what people are wanting to hear now uh, uh, yes. you know they're they're wanting to know of course they're coming in from the money but who cares you know there's necessary evils yeah exactly <laughs> you know? who cares and they're getting in on the bandwagon that's fine yeah yeah you know as long as it comes out that's fine it changes people's lives whether you want to or not and the big, big message from my patients is tell people not to fear. There is. Yes. We, it's so much better, but it was yeah, good, 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 good. <laughs> and I just tell people, please. I, I mean, as a Catholic, I can understand the guilt. <laughs> I'm, I'm there, <laughs> you know. But we are moving 
away from that. Yeah. Uh, Obama's doing, playing a big role in that. You know, Joel Osteen's playing a big role. You're yeah. playing a big role through your radio station. You know, okay. uh, and that's why, uh, you know, Dr. Turner and a lot of these, uh, yes. Peter Fenwick. Yeah. And if you haven't had Peter, uh, Peter, Dr. Peter Fenwick on your show, he's so incredible. He's from England. Oh, yes, I've and heard a lot about him. A neuropsych- yeah. neuropsychiatrist who mm. has written a book of, about also in hospice, but also near death. But he's more of a researcher, and he's doing uh, these documentaries with us as well. Oh, that's what I and wanted to ask you about, the research that has been done now on this, because that yeah, must be fascinating. So here's the thing. So the near death, they're out of their body. How do you, how do you research that? Yeah. You know, well, you research it, first of all. Scientists will only research things that are repetitive in large, large numbers. And we know now that uh, near death is a very repetitive pattern. Um, especially to bring patients back. Mm-hmm. And so they, I think Cornell University and uh, someone out of England are doing this uh, large, large study um, on, on near death. I know a Dr. Von Timmel, oh, yes. Von Timmel a German mm-hmm. cardiologist. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's in major research. He's written great books. But Europe's much more advanced. But a Dr. Bruce Grayson out yes. of the University of Virginia. Right. Incredible mm-hmm. physician. Uh, it, and, and so they're coming up with these theories. Okay, so if they're out of their body, how can we prove that? What can we do, you know? Well, mm. it's harder with a near death. You can only postulate things. Mm. Um, but with the pre-death, it's a lot easier because they're still living. Or, or I mean, they're still talking. Yeah. Uh, and so you can bring them in. One of the research is blood. Okay. Is there any new chemical? Oh, that's, that's being, interesting. The blood. That's being the blood. yeah. Is there any new chemical that's being released? Okay. And so they they found one. It's called DMT, dimethyltryptamine. Mm-hmm. And there's a Dr. Strassman um, who has a very uh, popular book, actually for a long for quite a time now. Uh, it's called I think the DMT molecule or the God molecule. Oh yes. Um, right. mm-hmm. He's a wonderful man. I think he's a Neuro, neuro radiologist, something like that. But he, uh, like like myself and like these other doctors, we just sort of came into this. It just we started seeing repetitive patterns. And he, being more of a pathology kind of guy, you know, neuro, he looked at blood work and and doing uh, autopsies. They they saw that there was a high chemical called DMT in these people mm-hmm. that passed away especially high-stress situations, and they did more research on it, and they found out are going to have hallucinations. You're right. going to see aliens, and <laughs> a lot of people see aliens, and they do see people, but they're not like, they're not like their deceased loved ones, okay? okay. Yeah. And they're not giving them messages from the other side, so forth. Uh, so, but we do know, so we know that alone, it, it, it's not responsible for that, and alone, it does cause a lot of anxiety. So, uh, but these people who are passing away, the ones that I'm interviewing a day, two, three days before, are smiling, are elated, are in ecstasy. Uh, it, I mean, they use this word, exhilarated. They're, they're dying with a smile yes. on their face. Yeah. I mean, not, and it is a real smile. And, and, uh, and so that's the chemical that's really, really high, but we know that it's all coming from the pineal gland. All right. uh, the gland, which is at the center of the brain, which we... Science really never paid attention to it. <laughs> they didn't think it did anything or, you know, it had no use. They always but say know, that. <laughs> yeah, and, mm. uh, but, you know, the Egyptians knew it. The, yes. the Egyptians would talk about the third eye, and that's what it's called. That's another name for it, the third eye. Uh, we know that it it's also uh, has some responsibility for sixth sense. So when people, these people are passing away, what we're doing other than just drawing blood, we're doing MRIs these new type of MRIs that look at the brain in real time. Mm -hmm. And one is called the functional MRI. The other one is called the magnetic electroencephalogram, which is the latest, latest, latest one. And there's only two in the United States and maybe one or two in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of them in the United States, which which is very interesting, was given anonymously, was paid for and given to one of the top hospitals. Anonymously. We don't know who it is or what, but was left with a note that this would be one of the the uh, the latest uh, technical machines that would prove or help prove an afterlife. Mm-hmm. And whoever it was, 
uh, doctors didn't know that. I mean, they weren't. They didn't know that that's what they. They were making that MRI just to look at the brain in real time. Actually, it's right at the moment that you're thinking, they can see where it lights up. So if you move your pinky, and you're in, you're under that MEG scan, which is which sort of looks like a 1950s hair dryer, right. and you're sitting right right under it. Yeah. Uh, it's picking up that area. If you're angry, it'll pick up that area right. where you're angry, and uh, so it shows a lot of patterns. So what happened? They were doing a, a MEG scan on a lady who, uh, in a functional MRI. Who they didn't think was going to die, but they, she had seizures, and they wanted to pinpoint them. Mm-hmm. And uh, by pinpointing them, they can do surgery and, and uh, you know, uh, burn it, and that way they won't have any more uh, uh, seizures. And so that's where they're coming from. But they found a tumor in this way. We have relationships with our children and our family, and then expect at the end of life that that person is going to judge us and send us to hell. Well, of course, that's such mm-hmm. farce. Yes. You know, that's yeah. that's that's dinosaur stuff. That's right. Good, good, good. good. <laughs> and I just tell people, please, I, I mean, as a Catholic, I can understand the guilt. <laughs> I'm, I'm there, <laughs> you know, but we are moving away from that. Yes. Uh, Obama's doing, playing a big role in that. You know, Joel Osteen's playing a big role. You're yes. playing a big role through your radio station, you know, yes. uh, and that's why, uh, you know, Dr. Turner and a lot of these, uh, yes. Peter Fenwick, yeah. And if you haven't had Peter, uh, Peter, Dr. Peter Fenwick on your show, he's so incredible. He's from England. Oh, yes, I've and heard a lot about him. A neuropsych- yeah. neuropsychiatrist who mm. has written a book of, about, also in hospice, but also near death. But he's more of a researcher. And he's doing uh, these documentaries with us as well. Oh, that's what I and, wanted to ask you about, the research that is being done now on this, because that yeah. must be fascinating. So here's the thing. So the near death, they're out of their body. How do you... How do you research that? Yeah. You know, well, you research it, first of all, scientists will only research things that are repetitive in large, large numbers. And we know now that uh, near death is a very repetitive pattern, um, especially to bring patients back. Mm -hmm. And so they, I think Cornell University and uh, someone out of England are doing this uh, large, large study um, on on near death. I know Dr. Von Timmel. Oh, yes. Von Timmel. A German mm-hmm. cardiologist. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's in major research. He's written great books. But Europe's much more advanced. But uh, Dr. Bruce Grayson out yes. of the University of Virginia, right? Incredible mm-hmm. physician. Uh, it, and, and so they're coming up with these theories. Okay, so if they're out of their body, how can we prove that? What can we do? You know, well, mm-hmm. it's harder with a near death. You can only postulate things. Mm-hmm. Um, but with a pre-death, it's a lot easier because they're still living, or, or I mean, they're still talking. Yeah. Uh, and so you can bring them in, one of the research is blood, okay? Is there any new chemical? Oh, that's, that's being, interesting, the blood. That's being, the blood. yeah, is there any new chemical that's being released? Okay. And so they they found one, it's called DMT, dimethyltryptamine, mm-hmm. and there's a Dr. Strassman, um, who has a very uh, popular book, actually for a long, for quite a, time now. Uh, It's called, I think, the DMT molecule or the God molecule. Oh, yes. Um, Mm -hmm. He's a wonderful man. I think he's a neuroradiologist, something like that. But he, uh, like like myself and like these other doctors, we just sort of came into this. It just, we started seeing repetitive patterns. And he, being more of a pathology kind of guy, you know, neuro, he looked at blood work and, and I didn't explain that. And uh, so, you know, we extrapolated that and said, hey, maybe we can do the MEG scan. Well, I don't have access to that, but we have the access to the PET scan and the MEG and the functional MRI, and both of those pick up more the blood flow to the brain, and it does pick up where the brain is working, but it lags by two seconds. The MEG scan, the nearest one, it works mainly through magnetic properties, through the quantum uh, field and uh, through nanoparticles that's being released by the brain cells. So it doesn't really totally rely on blood flow. So, um, you know, the down turn on this thing uh, with the functional MRI and the PET scan is that if people are very close to dying, their heart uh, is pumping very little blood. So with little blood pump being pumped, we're gonna, you know, the theory is, well, we're not going to get the same kind of results on the brain being lit. Uh, 
well, you know what? We did it anyhow. I did it anyhow. And uh, what I found out was incredible. Uh, the lady had a what we call an ejection fraction of about 15%, which 15% of her heart was pumping blood. You need about a good 20 plus percent, maybe maybe more. Anything 20 percent or less is hospice. You're terminally ill. Um, but it's not 100. It never gets to 100. Normal is 50 to 70. And so you need to, somewhere 30s or so forth to get enough blood flow, enough pressure behind it, the, you know, uh, to get it to the brain and to get the brain uh, to work properly. Well, these people with an ejection fraction of 15% were speaking so profound, so alert, and I'm going, wait, this is not possible. Oh. They, they barely have any pulses you can oh. pick up. Their, their skin's so pale. They're congested. They have no urine output. They're, they're just about dead. Yes. And, but they're talking like, like they're probably the most intelligent person in the world. And uh, like these idiot savants. And I'm going, wow, this is really weird. Let's get them down and do an MRI. Mm -hmm. Get them down and do the MRI and the PET scan. And it showed that the temporal lobes and a lot of the brain was lit up. Well, how was it lit up? without any blood flow yes. or significant blood flow. And so that's where, that's where as scientists, that's where we're at. We're, we, we believe that because of the MEG scan is picking up quantum particles, you know, magnetic. Yes. It's, a mag, it's a magnetic effect, but the physical body creates the tangible uh, ability or the ability to create that magnetic impulse. But if you don't have that blood flow, we believe, like everything else, there's a binary system. There's a backup system. 